this is a grey Mark IV Ford Focus. I know it's not a sizzling hot premiere, but stick around and I'll tell you why there weren't any new Ford reviews on my channel in recent years. If you're not interested in my Ford story and you just want me to get on with the review, skip to the timecode displayed on the screen. The short version is that a few years ago, relations between Ford Poland and me cooled down considerably. The last time I reviewed a Ford on this channel was in early 2018 and I had to push hard to get that Fiesta. Probably I was already put at the end of the queue as a warning. Without going into details, Ford's press office stopped giving me test cars. To their credit, they still responded to my emails with questions about technology or the market situation, so I know I wasn't going straight into the spam folder. I can live without Ford, and Ford obviously can live without me. Uh, only you guys lose out, because I know some of you value my opinion, thank you, and I couldn't give you one on Ford. So today, here's the not entirely new, but still relevant-ish Ford Focus. Where did I get it from? My partner and I have a second channel. It's in Polish, but maybe we should start translating it. I don't know. And on this channel, we have a sponsor, a long-term car rental company called Sayrent. If you're in Poland for a few months on a project and you need a car, check them out. This video is not sponsored, by the way. Anyway, a few months ago, as we were discussing uh, the other channel sponsorship, I said it would be cool if they could get us a relatively new Ford to review, and they bought several Focuses to rent out to their clients. And today I'm reviewing an almost new Focus with just 2,500 kilometers on the clock. So that's the sort of mileage you get from a press car after a couple of weeks. So shout out to Sayrent, and now on with the review. I'll spare you the Ford Focus story. This is an estate with a 120 horsepower, 1.5 liter diesel and a six-speed manual gearbox in the second lowest trim, which is called cool and connect or connected, depending on the market. This gets the magnetic gray paint, SYNC 3 infotainment system with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, but without satnav, heated seats and heated steering wheel, two-zone climate control, parking sensors front and rear, a backup camera, and cruise control. All this for a very reasonable 31,000 euro, something a normal person would buy, not the fancy stuff the media gets to review. The boot volume expanded almost 120 liters since last generation to 608 liters with the tire repair kit. Fold the rear seats and you get 1653 liters. Both numbers are higher than on the Toyota Corolla TS. There are release handles for the rear seats and the backrests are spring-loaded so you don't have to push them. Thanks to a double floor, there is a flat loading area. It's also good to see Ford abandoned the once popular seat folding solution, which required that you first lift the seat and then drop the backrest. Of course, the Skoda Octavia has a bigger boot, but it doesn't have a simply clever strap on which you pull and the load cover comes out like it's Nothing. This is probably the best mechanism I've seen so far, perhaps, except the quirky thing you get in the Civic hatchback. Now, this fits perfectly under the boot floor. And as you can see, there's a sort of divider here, which helps you store things in place. Then there is another movable, removable divider underneath. And then you can take the floor and just shove it up against the back seats, which lets you use all the space in the rear. Also, there are two sturdy shopping bag hooks and a 12-volt socket. Not much is happening in the back, at least in the lower trim models. There is a 12-volt socket, but an armrest with a cup holder and a ski hatch are an option, or standard on higher trim models. Thanks to extending the wheelbase by more than 5 cm, there is noticeably more legroom in the back than in the previous gen. The wide and soft tunnel remained. I don't understand why Ford couldn't just flatten it. Door pockets are average size. 
changes in the front are more substantial, but there is no wow factor. The dashboard has been tidied up and simplified. This version still has analog dials, and even the display between them is still monochrome. Gone are the once trendy tunnel gauges, but that's simply because higher trim models get a digital instrument panel. Under the central infotainment display, there are physical buttons and knobs for the radio and AC. Also, the climate control panel now features larger buttons and larger knobs, and everyone I know wants a big knob. There's a good amount of space for your phone, cup holders are adjustable, the glove box is average size and so is the storage under the armrest. The door pockets are lined with material so objects inside don't rattle about. The basic seats on this car fortunately do have lumbar support adjustment, but only for the driver. At first I couldn't find it, because the adjustment wheel is under the thigh rather than on the backrest. You can specify better seats with German Good for a Spine AGR certificate. If you have the opportunity to test drive cars with both type of seats, I strongly suggest you do so. The standard seats are not terrible, however I can see how the thigh bolster touches the height adjustment lever. Now, if this were a fleet car or if you and your better half significantly differ in height, this height adjustment lever will touch the bolster and the material will wear out quickly. Now, there is a lot of adjustment. Usually in compact cars, I try to lower the seat, but here I actually had to pump it up. And this is how I noticed the lever thing. Let's see how high I can go up. Oh, this is wearing out quickly as we speak. Jeez. A lot of seat adjustment. There. A few words about the infotainment system, or rather about its basic version. The tiles are large and easy to read. The menu is simple and logical. There is Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Just bear in mind, sometimes it takes a while for Android Auto to load. You leave the petrol station and be two blocks away before you'll see your map again. Also, the system crashed on me at least once a day. Perhaps this can be fixed with some sort of a software update, which this car may not have had, as it's practically new. And the start button is under a weird angle, as if it was an afterthought. The Ford Focus is available with petrol and diesel engines. We have 1 and 1.5 liter petrol engines and 1.5 and 2 liter diesels. The power ranges from 85 to 182 horsepower. Two of the petrol engines are so-called mild hybrids. You can choose between a 6-speed manual or an 8-speed automatic. This is a 1.5 liter Eco Blue diesel producing 120 horsepower. It is mated to a 6-speed manual. Ford promises fuel economy of less than 4 liters per 100 kilometers combined and slightly above 4 liters in the city. Optimistic, I'm getting below 5 combined. It's less than in the previous generation, but more than claimed, obviously. The 0 to 100 kilometers per hour time should be 10.3 seconds. I checked and I got a second slower. Perhaps if I tried a bit harder, I could shave off half a second, but not much more. But the 1.5 liter diesel in the Focus is best around mid-range. It can pick up speed without you having to downshift too much. Speaking of gear changes, this has a long throw. Also, the pedals are tightly spaced and the footwell is quite narrow. The clutch bites very low, so I find it difficult to find a good driving position. Either I'm too close to the dashboard to be able to press the clutch all the way in, or I'm too far and then I fear I'm not pushing the clutch far enough. The steering is engaging, like in most Fords I remember. I feel I'm driving a car, not a game console. There is a drive mode button next to the gear lever, but I didn't notice much of a difference between normal sport and eco. This car comes on 16-inch alloys, so they look like balloons. The upside is comfort, but I suspect if you choose the optional 17s, the car will look better, but the ride will remain sufficiently comfortable. What's less comfortable is the noise, it's not just the diesel, there's a lot of wind noise and noise from the cars passing by. Even at moderate speeds of like 80-90 km per hour, there is noticeable wind noise and visibility over the right shoulder is atrocious. 
The traffic sign recognition only reads road signs, but if it doesn't see a sign, you won't know the current speed limit. The automatic parking brake feature only works when you deliberately stop rather than roll to a halt. If you roll up to a stop, then you can roll back and also uphill start system won't work. I noticed two more things. Door closing sounds cheap. And there's a plastic bag with some, I don't know, mineral wool here under the bonnet. I checked the forums and apparently this is Ford's method for sound deadening. Cheap, light, easy to install, but couldn't they just put a plastic panel over it? Perhaps then it wouldn't be so cheap. The Mark IV Ford Focus proved to be a good evolution. Most things I complained about in the previous version have been addressed. And like the Ford Mondeo, also the Focus seems to make more sense in the lower spec. Is this why Ford was afraid to show me its new cars? Come on guys, you should stand by your product, not hide it from the media. And how do you like the not-so-new Ford Focus? There's a good chance some of you already own one and you can tell me which parts of this review you agree with and where do you think I'm full of shit? Let me know in the comment section below. If you like my sarcastic, down-to-earth and possibly mildly amusing car reviews, Join me every Friday at 3 p.m. Central European time and don't forget to subscribe and like this video as it helps me with the YouTube algorithm. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.